Everybody hear me? Is this on? Important conversation. Buddy. Right. We don't want to interrupt what I know are important conversations going on out there amongst you. And uh, again, just want to welcome you and thank you for being with us this afternoon. In this particular conversation and workshop, I am joined, I think they're good. Thanks, Ruth. Thank you. We welcome you to this conversation and discussion uh, regarding the relationship between white supremacy and these issues of mass incarceration and mass detention. I am joined this afternoon in this conversation uh, by with Jonathan Wilson Hargrove, who is a celebrated, as all of you know, spiritual writer, the author of several books on Christian spirituality, including Reconstructing the Gospel, Strangers at My Door, The Awakening of Hope, The Wisdom of Stability, and The New Monasticism. He is also co-author with Dr. William Barber on the third reconstruction, Moral Monsters, Moral Mondays. Well, there are moral monsters, right? Amen to that. Or maybe uh, immoral monsters. But Moral Mondays, fusion politics, and the rise of a new justice movement. In 2003, Jonathan and his wife Leah founded the Root, Rootba, Rootba House which is a house of hospitality where the formerly homeless share community with the formerly housed. And so he joins me, and I am Kelly Brown Douglas, he joins me in this conversation this afternoon. And so we thought that we would begin this conversation by uh, introducing one another and asking uh, how we each got involved in this work, or what brought us to this journey. After a conversation between uh, the two of us, we will do it, then invite you uh, into conversation or into a period of question and answers. And so I'm gonna begin, as I've introduced Jonathan, by asking him that question. Uh, how, what brought you into this work and on this journey? Well, let me begin by saying, what an honor it is for me to be here with Dean Kelly Brown Douglas, whose uh, uh, work on the black Christ touched me deeply. When I first uh, heard you begin with talking about what you learned from Mama in that book, uh, because it resonated so much with the gospel that really saved me, uh, that I uh, learned from my spiritual mother in Durham, North Carolina, Ann Atwater. I think, uh, I think they drank from some of the same streams. Uh, so it is a, a true, true honor to be here and uh, to be able to dialogue about this. Uh, I, it may be obvious to you all, listening to how we talk and observing how we look, that there are forces in this country that would not have us be together. And my own journey toward coming to realize the role that white supremacy has played through religion in this country to shape identity and to shape our public life um, has been a, a long and sometimes painful one. I was born in rural North Carolina, Stokes County, not too far from Mayberry. All my mama's people are from Mayberry. I mean, for real. My granny grew up with Andy Griffith. I was gonna say, are you a, related to Andy and Opie? Granny grew up with Andy <laughs> in a town called Mount Airy. Well, yeah. And when Andy went off to Hollywood, he did change the name of the town, but he didn't change the name of all the characters. So our only real claim to fame is that my uncle Otis was written into the story. He's the oh, town wow. drunk, if you haven't watched a rerun lately. Wow. So that's my people. 
And uh, we, were, uh, we were teetotalers, of course, because we were Southern Baptists, but we, we all knew Uncle Otis and others. And I grew up in a community that taught me earnestly to love Jesus and to memorize the Bible in the King James Version. So it was good enough for Jesus, it was good enough for us. We were sticking with it. And, and you know, my birth was announced at the Southern Baptist Church where I grew up the Sunday after Ronald Reagan was elected the first time. Mm. The first Make America Great Again campaign, 1980. Uh, and so I grew up in this world where my people, rural, white, so we were told, rural, white, conservative mm -hmm. people. This is how we identified ourselves. And as I increasingly came to learn how a lot of people invested a lot of money in us identifying ourselves. But a large part of my formation took place in that period of our uh, current American history when the religious right was beginning to uh, rise and to target faith communities like the one where I grew up as a potential base to sustain the Republican Party and to sustain it as a white party that connected the South with the suburbs of cities like New York and other places around the country with that sun belt that stretches all the way out to the West Coast. I didn't know any of this at the time, but that's where I was growing up. And in that context, the best thing I could think to do for Jesus based on what I heard at church every week and what I read in the free literature that was available, because we didn't have a lot of public libraries where I grew up, the free literature you could get at church, you know, for a kid like me who liked to read, that was, that was gold. And all that stuff was published by these right-wing organizations that were investing through Jerry Falwell's Moral Majority and increasingly the Family Research Council and all those groups that were organized through the Council for National Policy, that was targeted at people like me. And what they told me is that the best thing I could do for Jesus would be to become President of the United States. So that's what I wanted to do. And uh, I knew if I was going to do it, I had, to, I had to do the long, hard work of climbing the political ladder. We were not political people. But you know, uh, Jimmy Carter had done it and he was a peanut farmer. So I thought, well, I'll, I'll learn from him. So I got a book from the library and read about Jimmy Carter. And he had, uh, he had gone to the Naval Academy. So I thought That's, that'll be my start. And then I was just devastated to learn you can't even go to the Naval Academy if you don't have a recommendation from a senator. So I said, I got to get to know a US senator. So my granddaddy drove a Greyhound bus and we had a snow day from school. And so he took me to Washington, D.C. I thought you can find a senator at the U.S. Senate. Yeah. So we went and I walked into the place you could go as public. You know, back then it was a little easier to get in. And I saw young people like me in blue blazers running around on the floor. And I asked a security guard, who are those people? He said, they're Senate pages. I said, like they work in senators offices? He said, yeah, they're your age. And I said, uh, I got I to gotta get that. So, so I ended up as a teenager working in Strom Thurmond's office. Oh my. Trying to begin to climb the ladder toward my uh, life of public faithful service as I imagined it. And it was in that context that I began to see up close a little bit of what this politics actually looked like. And it didn't seem anything close to what my Sunday school teacher had told us. These people were concerned about power above all else. Freedom for them meant freedom for uh, corporations to do as much as they could, to make as much as they could, without, with as little regulation as possible. That was freedom. We talk about freedom in this context, it's a very different thing. But it was, a, it was, a, it was an important time for me, you know, as a teenager who saw a lot of things in black and white, to begin to be disillusioned of what was really going on. And I think uh, my own journey toward recognizing the, the power of religion in sustaining a narrative of white supremacy, and a lot of what we're talking about here, it began for me in seeing how my community was being used for political ends that frankly didn't benefit us very much, but that were deeply tied to our identity, right? 
that we could believe we were values voters. We could believe that, uh, uh, that we were standing up for righteousness when we sent these people to Congress to more or less do everything they could to guarantee the rights of corporations. And, and, and I don't think, you know, as a kid, I could see that there was some contradiction in that. I don't think I could have found my way out of that if I hadn't about that same time met a preacher from my home state who happens to be uh, on the faculty here now, the Reverend William Barber, who began to introduce me to a very different way of being Christian in public. A way of being Christian that's probably much more familiar to you and your story. So let me turn from, from my own origins to uh, how, how about for you? How did you come to see the power of this narrative? Yeah, thank you. Wow, your story. And it's funny, we, we will see that we're uh, not only geographically in different parts of the country growing up in a different culture and all of the ways in which people can just look and see us and see how differently are, we are. We're uh, demographically, we're generationally different because uh, while you were born into the, uh, as you say, first Make America Great Again, uh, campaign in modern times under Ronald Reagan. Well, I was uh, in graduate school uh, uh, and I was watching uh, in real time, not on reruns, and I was loving your uh, uncle uh, Otis. We, 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 we liked him on Andy Griffith. Uh, he could let himself out of the jail, always like that. That's yeah. right, that's right. Not recognizing when I was watching him that there was something strange about Mayberry, or, uh, and that was that there were no people that looked like me. Yeah. I grew up in Dayton, Ohio. Mm. And probably the most uh, influential year in my growing up, as I now look back, was 1963. Mm. That was quite a year to be a seven-year-old. Wow. Yeah. In 1963, that was the year of the church bombings in Birmingham of the four little girls. And I clearly remember my parents whispering about that and what a shame it was they whispered that those four little girls were killed in that church. And I can remember, I believe it was my father who said, yep, and whenever they catch the man that did it, nothing's gonna happen to them. Mm -hmm. I'm taking that in to my seven-year-old consciousness. Mm -hmm. I remember watching on television. I didn't know what I was watching, but the dogs attacking what I remember and identified with the children. Mm -hmm. Dogs attacking these children. I didn't know what I was watching at the time, mm -hmm. but I took it in. Mm -hmm. I now know today I, am to, I have a, a deep fear of dogs. Mm -hmm. And it no doubt goes back mm -hmm. to those images seared into my consciousness. I remember hearing my parents and other adults around me whispering. You know how adults always whisper because they don't, or spell, right? Because they don't want the kids to understand until they figure out you know how to spell. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I remember hearing the adults around me whispering about how awful it was mm -hmm. that this man was killed in his driveway in front of his children. And again, I remember hearing someone say, when they catch the man that did it, mm. nothing's gonna happen to him. Mm. I, of course, would later learn that that was Maker Evers. All of these things are being imprinted upon my mind at the same time that there is unrest growing in Dayton, Ohio. Mm -hmm. Dayton was a very segregated city, mm -hmm. and any time, remains very segregated. And any time you heard about the west side of Dayton, that was where black people lived, and it was segregated black and white. It was only black and white. Then, and the rest of Dayton was white. 
And so I, I remember that very well. So it was perhaps those things that were being imprinted upon my consciousness and in my memory as a seven-year-old that calls me to ask my dad, and I can see it as if it was yesterday. I asked my dad, I said, Daddy, why do white people treat us so badly? And in my seven-year-old mind, I thought that there must have been something that we did. At that time, we weren't calling ourselves black, so it was Negro, but something that we must have done as Negroes mm -hmm. that calls white people to treat us so badly, because I couldn't imagine. Yeah. And, and imagine that I'm thinking this, right, as a, as a child, that we did something. Mm. And I said, if we could figure that out, then we could stop doing it, and mm. white people would stop treating us so badly. Mm. So I don't remember what it was that my father said mm. at that time. But that question stayed with me. And I don't remember if it was a week or a day or a month that passed. Mm. But we're walking down out the uh, front door of my house and I, my dad and I are going somewhere and, and I stop on the porch and I say, Daddy, I figured it out, as if we were having this running conversation. Mm. And dad goes, figured what out? I said, what we did to make white people treat us so badly. And daddy said, oh, what? And I said, nothing. Mm. That was so freeing for me. Mm. I said, we didn't do anything. I said, they just treat us that way because they want to. But, and it could be anybody, it's just us. Little did I know at the time is that it was not just us. Mm. That was my first wrestlings with what I would come to understand to be white supremacy. Yeah. Yeah. Then fast forward 50 years later, yeah. and I find myself asking the same question. Mm -hmm. And I'm asking it this time in relationship to Trayvon Martin's murder. Yeah. And for some reason, I had lived through Oscar Grant, Michael Stewart, uh, Eleanor Bumpers. I was here in New York at Union when that occurred. Mm. Uh, but this, this murder mm. of Trayvon grabbed me in a way that I could not let it go. Mm. Maybe it was because at the time I had a son about just a little bit older than Trayvon. Mm. Maybe it was because I never did think we were in any kind of post-racial anything, but maybe, you know, it was because we had this black president, something, or that there was his mother mm. pleading for justice for her son. Mm. And mm. I had often said to my son, you know, that I will defend you to my death, mm. but I do not want to defend you in your death. Mm. And so in her, I saw me and my son. Hmm. And then there was Jonathan and Jordan and uh, Renisha. And I, ha I asked myself again, hmm. in a different way now, that I remembered something that Martin Luther King Jr. had said uh, after John F. Kennedy was assassinated and uh, sometime after that, and, Ken and King said that, Yes, it's important to know who killed Kennedy, but what's more important is what killed Kennedy. Yeah. And that's what I wanted to know now. Mm -hmm. What was killing our children? Mm -hmm. So that, mm -hmm. so I started my quest really to discover the answer to that mm -hmm. in a different way after years and years of work really looking at, 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 at black faith and the way in which religion hmm. plays a part in that. So I'll say this briefly, because parallel to that, which ended, uh, culminated in the black Christ that you had spoken of mm -hmm. earlier, I was very, I was uh, born and raised Episcopalian mm -hmm. and loved going to church. Uh, and every Sunday would wake my parents to take me to church, much to the dismay of my three siblings who would do this to me. <laughs> uh, 
uh, to, uh, and off to church I would go and I would stay for uh, the morning service, Sunday school in between, and uh, this afternoon service. Now I'm Episcopalian, so before, I'm like if he went for services, he was in church all day. That's right. Being Episcopalian, you get two services in and Sunday school in your home for the noon football game. Uh, the, so, so don't think, oh my goodness, she lived in church all day. No, a few hours. But nevertheless, I loved, liked what you were there for. I liked what you I liked was that. there yeah, for. Yeah. Because I liked hearing stories about Jesus. Mm -hmm. mm. And I related to the baby Jesus in the manger. Yeah. And I would cry when we would sing, I cried a lot, when we would sing this song, Away in the Manger, mm. right? Because somehow mm. I knew that that story connected yeah. Yeah. to the reality of poor black children. Mm. Which was, but when I, by the time I got to college and my awareness of who I was as a black American grew, which was when these things happen, when you really grow into yourself yeah. in college. And I became more engaged in this struggle that I wasn't yet naming white supremacy, but white racism and all of that then. I had this sort of existential crisis hmm. and I wanted to know what Jesus had to do with it. Mm -hmm. And I said that if Jesus doesn't have anything to do with my blackness and my struggle just to be black mm. without being attacked for that and to live fully into who I am, then I was ready to let Jesus go because mm. I wasn't going to let go of my blackness. And if Jesus didn't have anything to do with the black struggle, then Jesus and Christianity could go. Mm. And it was at that time that I was introduced to James Cone's book, The Black Theology of Liberation. Mm -hmm by a white man, and so I said, oh my God, either something's wrong with the book or something's wrong with the white man who introduced it to me. Because this book was something about that, right? Whiteness is of the Antichrist and God is black. I said, oh, Lord Jesus. And I read that book twice in one weekend. Mm. And what I discovered was that the book was introducing me really to my grandmother's faith. Yeah, yeah. And it was out of that that the black Christ that you spoke of emerged mm -hmm. to more deeply understand that. Yeah. So that's, that's my journey mm. and that's how I sort of got here uh, in the, this work that we do mm. in trying to dismantle yeah. uh, white supremacy. And so as we talk about that, obviously when, when we talk about white supremacy, what What's that mean for you? Yeah. You know, hearing you talk about your faith journey, one of the things I, I can hear you saying in that crisis moment is white supremacy meant for you that if Jesus was going to take away your identity as a black woman, you had to get rid of him. He had to go. Yeah. And you know, I had to come to a similar realization from the other side, right? That if the white Jesus that uh, uh, gave me an identity that was tied to this white lie, if that was all Christianity was, I had, to, I had to leave it too. Because it wasn't good news for me either. That, so... That, that has been my own journey of coming to understand what, what is white supremacy, in particular in relation to Christian faith. Uh, white supremacy is a negation of Christian faith That's right. that has operated through Christian faith. Because, you know, that's what St. Augustine taught us about sin. It's nothing. A sin is a hole in a shirt, right? He said, God didn't create sin you got to take a good thing and mess it up to have sin. That's St. Augustine's definition of sin. But if you, as I came to apply that to what white supremacy was, it was a hole in Christianity. It was taking this, this, this faith of Jesus and, and using it as a justification, an explanation for why one people could puff themselves up, and they could use everybody else and everybody else's 
land and labor, and that the order that, that was established in that was somehow divine. And, and I had to go back and begin to try to understand how did that happen to my people? How did that happen to faith in this country? And how do we, how do we get free from that? I, it, for me, it was a journey of coming to understand that what Frederick Douglass said is true, that there is a difference between the Christianity of the slaveholder and the Christianity of Christ. That in many ways, that's a fundamental difference. That while both go by the name Christianity, they're worshiping two different gods. And, the, and if, we, if we call the, the slaveholder religion white supremacy, then it is in many ways a way of reading the Bible and of understanding the God of the Bible that is counter to what that text and its God and its spiritual power was meant to do. Um, so that's, that, that's been a lot of my own journey. Um, and as, as I have grappled with that and as I listened to your own journey with it, um, a lot of what I've been thinking about as we've been talking this weekend is, you know, where, where this really hits the ground in my own grappling these days is, you know, we do have this, we do have this system of mass incarceration that we've been talking about where it is seen as normal that, you know, uh, incredibly disproportionate numbers of people from particularly, from particular communities can be uh, locked up sometimes for life for things that, uh, you know, people who I knew growing up did them too and never went to jail. So th there's, there's, that, there's that piece of it. And then there's at the same time this demonization of immigrants and the way in which it's, it's become normal to, to see ICE raid communities. And, and th there's often this question in public life of where are the Christians? What are the Christians saying? And there's an attempt to sort of say, well, it shouldn't be too extreme. You know, we, 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 we should be compassionate. We, we should make sure that it's, it's, it's not uh, uh, overborne. Um, but kind of along the lines of uh, what Rashad was saying earlier in the session, that, that there's very little Christianity in public life that's saying this is antichrist, right? This is an attack on the image of God in people, and it's all based on a lie. And so for, for, for me, a, a lot of the question is, is how have we built ways of worshiping God and of teaching people faith that makes it possible to say, you know, the unimaginable is happening, and the best we can often say is, uh, you know, couldn't we send some, some resources down there so it, it's not as bad for the little kids or something like that, right? right, right, right. How, how is it that the revolutionary message of a Jesus who wants to set us free from these systems of oppression is not challenging the whole system as it is? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you've left me uh, <laughs> a lot to respond to in that regard. Let me first say, speak to this thing of white supremacy and religion and Christianity's complicity in it in a couple of ways. First, let me say something about white supremacy okay. and why I think it becomes important. You, you notice how our language, even in our public discourse, has changed now from sort of white racism mm -hmm. to talking about white supremacy. And what makes that an important change? Though in some ways we're talking about the same things and in another way we're t understanding the complexity of what's going on hmm. differently and I think that that becomes important. Because when we talk about white supremacy, I think it forces us to ask the question, what is the root of this? And what we have, as we notice the way in which white supremacy plays itself out, 
today in our in 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 uh, our culture, in our public square, and in our uh, politics, etc., that we are talking about an attack not simply upon black bodies. Mm -hmm. We were talk talking about an attack upon uh, non-white bodies. Mm -hmm. We are also talking about an attack upon uh, LGBTQ persons. Mm -hmm. It's the same narrative. Mm -hmm. We're also talking about uh, a narrative that is also a, a misogynistic narrative. Yeah. So when we're talking about white supremacy, we're talking about systems and structures, ideology and culture that suborns, that supports, that sustains uh, anti-blackness, uh, xenophobia, misogyny, mm -hmm. uh, and LGBTQ terrorism. Mm -hmm. And so what is that? Mm -hmm. That's what I was in quest to understand, yeah. to try to understand. And at the heart of that, it, is we trace that narrative, and as I have come to understand it, is, is this thing that I think we've all heard of in some way or the other called the Anglo-Saxon myth, right? Mm -hmm. And we've got to understand that the founders of this country, and as well as the Puritan and, uh, Puritan and pilgrims that came to this country really, 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 truly believed themselves to be carrying forth the heritage and the legacy of an exceptional Anglo-Saxon people. Mm -hmm. You don't have to do much research to get back to that. They believed that they were founding a nation mm -hmm. that was going to indeed be a city on the hill Mm -hmm. that was going to be a shining beacon of what it meant to be politically, culturally, if not demographically, mm -hmm. an exceptional Anglo-Saxon nation. American exceptionalism was equivalent to Anglo-Saxon exceptionalism. We gotta understand that to understand yeah. how white supremacy then functions. Yeah. Now the other thing we gotta understand is that while they believed they were founding that politically and culturally, they also believed they were the new Israelites. So there was always a religious narrative. Mm -hmm. And so they believed that they were cho the new chosen people mm -hmm. doing that. So that God, in essence, in, in short end, God was an Anglo-Saxon God. God looked like them. God was sustaining this nation. When we talk about one nation under God, mm -hmm. that's what they meant. Mm -hmm. They didn't mean our nation under God and everybody else's nation under God. They meant their nation under God because they and God had this nice little Anglo-Saxon thing going on. Mm -hmm. and, that, and it's in the narratives. And our founding fathers believed that. So the question becomes then, what is it that makes one exceptional? Because we know that all the immigrants that came to this country, even from Europe, they weren't what? They weren't Anglo-Saxon. That's right. But what did they have in common? Whiteness. And whiteness became the passport into the exceptional terrain of what it meant to be an American. Mm -hmm. But at the base of this, right, is what, what, are the, what is the thing that makes America exceptional, this Anglo-Saxon exceptionalism? What is the narrative of this? Anything that challenges that mm -hmm. is that then which is other. Mm -hmm. And so we're talking about a Protestant, Puritan, evangelical mm -hmm. tradition of whiteness that is also uh, set up to be patriarchal or misogynistic. Yeah. And then when, if you understand that and white supremacy emerges out of whiteness being the passport to that, well, if you understand that, you understand why certain people are attacked by a white supremacist narrative. Mm -hmm. And so, we can begin to understand how it's functioning mm -hmm. in our country today. And it's at the root, it's in our DNA, it's who we are. So it doesn't take much provocation like making America great again for it to reemerge, yeah. right? Because it's there. And so all you have to do is let the genie out of the bottle again, mm -hmm. right? Because mm -hmm. it's there. We've never done anything to excavate it. We've never done anything to root it out because yeah. we've never told the truth about it. Mm -hmm. This country was founded to be an Anglo-Saxon exceptionalist nation, a white nation. We got to tell the truth about that. Mm -hmm. Christianity. So let's just sort of leave, 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 leave that. So how does this function? How, how is it that we got to this point? 
And how is it that we have allowed these things to go on and, and, and we act like they're normal, just as you've said? Power. This kind of oppressive, dominating, subjugating, dehumanizing power does not, is not get its power or is not most effective when it's coercive. Mm -hmm. Because when it's simply coercive, people uprise against it. Yeah. It has to have something else. Power has to be productive. It has to be discursive. It has this will to knowledge. That is, it provides itself with the knowledge it needs to sustain yeah. itself. So what are the, what disciplines are sort of the disciplines that we turn to that have an authority in terms of truth and knowledge? Science and religion. Yeah. And if you can get science to support the way in which you treat, women's uh, uh, subjugation, mm -hmm. black subjugation. You could get science, you know, it's, when I was growing up, we all did these little IQ tests, mm -hmm. right? And then you could say, well, you know, we want to be able to say that black people can go to school and they can learn, but look at the IQ test, they just mm -hmm. don't have it. Yeah. The apex of scientific racism and religious racism in the 18th century came together. Mm -hmm. And so that one could say, well, God created these people to be enslaved. And if you think that this is like just in the 18th century, and our Vice President of Communications can affirm this well, this was last year. I was on mm. talking about Christianity and, uh, and make America great again, and someone called in, right? And they said, well, this was 2018 on C-SPAN for everybody to see. Someone called in and said, well, Reverend, you know, what can I say? Yeah, talking about how come black people were treated the way we treat it. Uh, it's in the Bible. Mm. And it said, it's just the way we were created. Mm -hmm. So I'm listening. And they said, because you know, on the seventh day, God created Adam and Eve. Now I'm sure you've heard this narrative. Mm -hmm. And that's when white people were created. Mm. So black people were created on the sixth day. Mm. Of course, my sisters are texting me because they're Episcopalian too. We don't know the Bible that well. So they're like, who create, who's created on the sixth day? <laughs> I, had to go tell them where, I had to tell them where Genesis was. Uh, <laughs> but that narrative, yeah. and of yeah. course, those were the beasts. Mm -hmm. All kind of narratives, Christian narratives, this were created to sustain white supremacy. Yeah, yeah. Because that's the way, so that people would believe the way things are is the way they're supposed to be. Yeah. Scientifically, they prove we're genetically inferior, and then God created us to be that way. And one last thing mm -hmm. on this. So where do we get another narrative? Mm. Well, black faith has always provided this narrative of resistance when it's at its best, right? Yeah, yeah. Because the enslaved, here's what they knew. Even though they're enslavers, just as you've said, used Christianity to sustain their enslavement mm -hmm. or to suggest that they were created to be enslaved. Well, here's the thing. Their enslavers may have introduced them to Christianity. Some of, and for some, they were already Christian, but they didn't introduce them to God. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I forget. They knew God mm -hmm. before they were enslaved. They knew God when they were free, and God mm -hmm. knew them when they were free. Yeah. So they knew that they were not created to be slaves. Mm -hmm. And they bought that with them. Mm -hmm. And that became the resistance to what their enslavers were to. And then, you know, I do know that little saying that Jesus, the, the rocks will cry out. Mm. Somehow, even though their enslavers withheld from them the Bible, mm -hmm. some, because they, they knew what they were going to find out in the Bible, they might hear about this story of Moses and the God of the Exodus. Mm -hmm. 
And they heard that story. And they heard the story of Jesus. Poor little Jesus boy born in a manger world. Treat him so mean. Treat me so mean too. Mm. They, uh, were you there when they crucified my Lord? They whipped him up the hill, up the hill, up the hill. Mm. They identified with that. Yeah. And they said, ah, that God mm -hmm. of that Jesus is the God we knew before we were enslaved. Yeah. And so the enslaved, as I always say, there were those who were born into slavery, who died in slavery, mm -hmm. never ever breathed a free breath, never dreamt that they would breathe a free breath, but they fought for freedom anyhow, mm. and they fought for freedom anyhow because they believed in the freedom mm. that was the justice of God. Yeah. And that's the resistance yeah. to a narrative that says otherwise. Mm. Amen. Yeah, amen that. You know, I think what you were saying earlier about how scientific racism and religious racism have offered a kind of authority to this, to this power structure that we've inherited um, is so important. And I think sometimes in contemporary discourse, maybe this was a little a little more possible to believe in the Obama years. You know, there was a way, there was a way in which we, we talked a lot in public life about how the United States was secularizing, maybe looking more like Europe, and, and, and maybe those, you know, scientific ideas, uh, you know, that, that, that we've tried to uh, unlearn and dispel, you know, the scientific, the, the, the sort of, uh, you know, measuring cranial sizes and, uh, and, and more recently IQ tests, but we've, we've been trying to dispel this within the academy. And I think there was some kind of, um, I think, liberal false hope that uh, if we could just get the science right, that we could leave the religion behind. And it seems to me that it's a painful reality of contemporary public life and the role of white supremacy is that religion has raised its head. This religion, this religious force of white supremacy uh, is, I mean, turn on the TV almost any weekend. You got Robert Jeffress, Franklin Graham, Paula White, whoever it is they call on to, to, to quote the Bible. And we know that, as the Trump campaign knows, that the only hope they have of another four years is this so-called white evangelical base that can be turned out with this explicitly but see, racist John, but religion. I want to say that religion never went anywhere, that it's always, that that narrative has oh, yeah. always been there. Absolutely. To sustain it. And, and, and what we're just, and even as you talk about your first introductions, I mean, we had the moral majority, right, yes, under yes, yes, Reagan. Yes. So we already saw that very visible reality yeah. of the Falwells, et cetera. But they were uh, already but a we part of... we wanted to dismiss it. Right, but they were already a part of a tradition. That's right. That was already funny. Lay in the groundwork that's all the right. time, so, all the time. So th th that's right. So that you, you escaped it, right, mm. Jonathan? But what about those not people? Not many get out. Let me tell you, right. I'm here to tell you, not many get out. That's right, and that's what I'm talking about. That base yeah. that we're talking about, they just didn't emerge. Yeah. And so there's already a religion that is all this evangel Protestant Puritan evangelical tradition that is all is has been the prevailing narrative in this yes. country. Yes. And 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 so that has always been there and so that even though people, perhaps some people are just recognizing it because it, it's the way in which media and internet and all of that function mm -hmm. today, but we wouldn't get here, we wouldn't be here in this situation in which we find ourselves that we have never really confronted mm -hmm. white supremacy the way we uh, need to confront it, that we still, it doesn't take much provocation for it to rear its head in such a visceral way, if indeed there was not always functioning mm -hmm. this sacred canopy over that and people are going into their churches every day yes. or every Sunday usually these evangelicals go every day mm -hmm. uh, to, in hearing that yes. and so it's always been there I'm so, so I, I you know I just push back a little that it ain't new 
And it's always been there. No, and no, this you just get you, been prevailing. Yes, you're getting you're getting where I was trying to go faster than I was, which yeah. I appreciate. I I was simply trying to say that the public imagination that that was somehow something we could leave behind That's right. has now, I think, been somewhat dissolute. I think people are aware now that re religion is playing an important role, which I think gives us the opportunity to look at where you were pointing for hope as also a very concrete factor in American history. I'm thinking about Reconstruction, right? The folks who prayed for freedom, knowing that they might never see it in their lives, actually, in the South, there's a concrete history of what those people did in public life. Where I'm from in North Carolina, the first Freedmen's Convention was held in Raleigh in 1865. They elected J.W. Hood to be their president. Right. He laid down the priorities. They were very similar to the priorities in other Freedmen's Conventions, where black folks came together in public for the first time in the South to say, you know, what do we want in public life? We want fair representation in the courts, right? We want the opportunity to, so equal protection under the law, opportunity to serve on juries so that that, you know, could be a reality. And we want to vote. That's what we want. And sent J.W. Hood to the legislature where he became one of the principal authors of our constitution in North Carolina, which we appeal to all the time in North Carolina these days because it's got some real stuff in it. You know, we just won in state court overturning racial gerrymandering, racist gerrymandering, after 10 years of struggle, and we won it on the Constitution that J.W. Hood mm -hmm. helped to write, right? So I look to the, something like that, you know, a preacher who became a politician, worked together with other black folks and white folks to, 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 to form a fusion coalition in North Carolina. And I see an example of how a very different reading of Jesus and of the Bible has given people an imagination for saying we can come together, right? Oh no, I, 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 yeah, yeah, I agree with that. I, yeah. I agree. I think that we have to live in, our task is to live not in uh, accountable to a status quo, but into this, into yeah. this vision. Yeah. It, but it, and of course, and I, you're right about what happened in that short window Short. Of, of, of reconstruction. You know, you know me, I might have to push back a please, little bit on please, that. Please. That's true. The other thing they gave, by the way, is public education. Yes. Uh, uh, and, and, that, and those were black people fighting uh, uh, after reconstruction, the uh, formerly enslaved fighting for education. And, right. and it was because through that fight, through that struggle, that we really get public education. And winning it for their folk and, and for mine. That's exactly right. My people were never educated that, before the war. That's exactly right. That's, that's right. exactly right. But then there's always this pushback. Yeah. Because Redemption. any. That's right. Any. That's exactly right. Yeah. Any first modicum of progress that we ever see in terms of black progress, there has always yeah. been historically, it happened at Reconstruction, it happened after the Civil Rights Movement, right. there's always this white backlash. Yeah. And, with, and, and it happened in the, uh, obviously, after Obama. And, mm -hmm. and in so many respects, what we are now seeing is a proportional response to a black man being in a place that this country never intended him to be, in the yeah. White House. And so yeah. we get the proportional response and the backlash to that in what we're seeing right now. <laughs> the distressing thing yeah. is that there is, uh, if, even if that's not distressing enough, that there's always been a resurgence of the religious narrative that has sustained that. Yes. And so we see that, of course, post-Reconstruction. Uh, mm -hmm. And it was, as well, a religious narrative that helped to sustain the rebirth of the, of the KKK during that time, yeah. right? Yeah. And, 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 and there's rituals and symbols. And so, what, so I agree, what we, what we don't see as much on the public square is the counter religious, which I don't even say is counter, I'm with you, the, the uh, the Christian narrative on that square yeah. in a different way. And what is it, and my question, and I and, and ask you, what is it about, because the evangelical right, if we want to put them in that sort of broad category, they're out there. Yeah. They're, they, they know what they want. 
And they're going after what they want, and they have a large voice mm -hmm. on, on the public square. And, and I indict folks, where is the other narrative? Mm -hmm. You know, why aren't we out there? Why aren't we taking control? Of, of the discourse. Where is that narrative? Mm -hmm. you know, it, it's, it's that narrative, I think of Martin Luther King Jr. and we've romanticized that period of time with Martin Luther King mm -hmm. Jr. because it wasn't like America loved Martin Luther King Jr. and it wasn't like uh, Christ, Christian tradition, Christian churches loved Martin Luther King Jr. That's right. All right? And so, it, and especially after he critiqued uh, the Vietnam War, it's everybody abandoned him mm -hmm. after that. But during the Civil Rights Movement, and we know mainstream faith traditions came together and wrote the letter that uh, precipitated King's letter from the Birmingham jail. So where, where are we mm. uh, on that narrative? I so agree with you that we, this the faith community, we must take back the narrative. We must be the people standing in the breach, uh, as, mm. as uh, Reverend Barber says, to begin to fight for a different reality, but we aren't there. Mm. So where are we? Why is it? Why is it easier for the evangelical right to coalesce and not us? So one of the things I learned trying to pay attention to slaveholder religion in its origins is that the faith that developed quickly, <laughs> the, faith, the faith that developed to prop up white supremacy in this country uh, did it by imagining that white people could be faithful to their, to their Christianity and keep enslaving people by believing that essentially salvation is about their souls, right? And, and, and so you could baptize enslaved people because that was not in any way going to free their bodies. It was only going to give hope to their souls, which created the possibility of a Christianity that isn't politically engaged. And I think that is the form of slaveholder religion that we have received and passed on often, you know, across all sorts of traditions, liberal, conservative, this notion that, you know, faith is basically about you, how you're doing your family, and that's what we talk about when you come to church, and what's happening in public life, we, we, we separate those things. There's even a, a good bit of liberalism that does that, you know, that says, we don't want to be divisive Right? We want to hold the church together so we don't talk about some of these hard things in church. And I believe that the prophetic tradition that grows out of, you know, those folks who knew that God had raised Israel out of Egypt and Jesus from the dead, and, it, you know, if God delivered Daniel, surely won't he deliver me? That tradition says there's no way to follow Jesus without being political. Now, we, we, our imagination can't be captive to this partisan framing, left-right framing that we're so often given. No, it's got to be broader than that. But it's got to be political. It's got to be about people in cages. Not just when, you know, the Trump administration is doing it at the border, but this has been going on for a long time. This is what we're talking about. So we, we have to reclaim a faith, and that's where I'm always looking, whether it's reconstruction or civil rights movement or the labor movement or, you know, the sanctuary movement in the 80s, wherever it is, where is the faith that has come together to say we've got to be in public the good news for what this other side that you're pointing to is just propping up. Let's, uh, I see questions let's continue answers. this conversation <laughs> with our friends in the room. Yeah. What, what does this bring up for y'all? There's a hand in the back there. Hi, uh, my name is Shai. I'm uh, representing Pathways to Apprenticeship. Um, I want to thank you guys for your stories. Uh, they were uh, very warm. Um, I, was, I was interested in hearing about, you know, your childhoods. You guys said something both that, that was really interesting to me. Um, one was you mentioned labor and law, I'm sorry, labor and land. Um, and you mentioned um, uh, Anglo-Saxons, Anglo right? And I'm just wondering, how do you guys feel like, because the, the topic is uh, white, supremacy, white supremacy, how do you feel like that all ties in? 
Yeah. Say more. I want to. I want to see what, okay. I, what you're trying to tie together. So, when you mention um, labor and land, right? Do you feel like labor and land have a direct relation to white supremacy? Oh, yeah. yeah. For sure. Yeah. And how so? Okay. Yeah. I'll answer briefly, and then uh, let Jonathan and I'll. And then I can, I'm sorry, I can go back to what I wanted to say about you, but if you guys can answer that first, that would be great. Oh, okay, then I'll say this real, yes. real briefly. Uh, when we're talking about white supremacy and we're talking about the privileges of, of whiteness, right? Mm -hmm. What are what 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 W. B. Du Bois used to call uh, the wages of whiteness? Uh, those privileges that you get simply because. You, you're white. Right. And one of those privileges is the privilege to uh, get the benefit of your own labor. And one of those privileges as well is, is the privilege of space. And who is afforded uh, free space. And so one of the things that we see, of course, are that uh, that's, those are privileges of whiteness. And so even if you think of something like uh, stand your ground law and all these, this, it, what we're actually talking about is who has the privilege to navigate free space and whose space is it. So white supremacy, in as much as it is about the privileges of whiteness, those privileges play out in terms of labor and land. I understand that, but I mean, more directly, this country was built on labor of slaves. Mm -hmm. So what it, when, you bring, when you say that, um, when you say that we were founded off it being uh, Anglo-Saxon, doesn't it seem more like the reason that they brought blacks here was just to have the labor? Yeah. I understand the free space and all that, yes. but the yes. labor, without, without the labor, because if, if they were bringing blacks here, uh, wh why would you bring blacks here if it was supposed to be an Anglo-Saxon? Anglo no, um, that's right. No, that, no, that's right. Yeah, no, that was, yes, that's right. Uh, most Africans who came to this country didn't come by free choice. Right. So they, yes, and they so came the, specifically to build. That's right, and that's the beginnings. The, the, that's the proto uh, mass incarceration system. Right, and, uh, and that, that's actually what I wanted right, to free reference labor. when we're talking about mass incarceration and we're talking about white supremacy and we're talking about labor and land. Right. There, the one connection is through mass incarceration, through slavery. It was all for labor. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, and who got to move about in free space, right? You said, so, I'm sorry, could you repeat that? And who gets to move about in free space? Who has the privilege of free space? Who has the privilege of navigating space? And, and so mass incarceration, it, labor and land go together. And as much as it is about free labor, it is also about, which is always connected, who has the right to move about freely, who has the right to space, All right? And so, and, and what we see there is the beginnings of what we now have as a mass incarceration system. Gotcha, well, thank you. And I, and I would only add, I think this is absolutely right, I would only add that this is also what we're dealing with on the detention That's side exactly too. Right. That's that exactly it, right. That a plantation economy that needed that kind of labor was happy to receive people from the South you know, Mexicans, other Central American immigrants who came to this country to do that work, and yet the possibility of them and their children becoming citizens challenges white supremacy to the point that there's a reaction against it now. Exactly so I think that's where they connect in, in, in around labor. Yeah. yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, hey, and uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, my name is Jim. I'm a first year MDiv student here at Union. Um, I just, I wanted to go back to sort of how you close, uh, Dean Douglas, and, and talk about the, the church's role, um, because I think, you know, we mentioned that we're, we're not seeing uh, the church or Christians, Christianity responding to 
uh, you know, what the right is doing with uh, the religion, so to speak. So, you know, a little bit more about why are we not seeing the, you know, it's funny, not funny to call it the alternative narrative because it's the narrative. That one is the wrong narrative. Um, why are we not seeing that? And, and if it does exist, why aren't we hearing about it? You know, it, it may be in, in books, but it, it certainly doesn't seem to be playing out, um, you know, in public media or in other outlets. We don't seem to have a Martin Luther King, uh, you know, that we're seeing on TV every day. There's not, you know, there's not that kind of energy, it seems, behind it. <laughs> Yeah, and I, it helped me out here. First of all, you know, there are people obviously standing in the breach and doing the work. Mm -hmm. and, and so we've, we've got to recognize that and, and do on the ground doing the work, you know, from the Reverend Barbers to uh, the, um, uh, oh, I can't think of, uh, uh, Wilson and uh, Ferguson, I can't mm -hmm. think of his uh, first name right now. Uh, Starsky. To Starsky, mm -hmm. Wilson and, and Ferguson to Heber Browns and uh, Baltimore. So there are people doing the work, but your question uh, says, so why, why does that not get the kind of attention, let's say, and why isn't there more of this uh, coalition or coalescence that this, this, this voice, <sighs> I don't, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, 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 I think there are a couple of things. Uh, one, when you think about sort of the fundament, evangelical fundamentalist right, and because and I don't want to put at all, obviously, all evangelicals into this category, but when you talk, think about that narrative, one thing we know that they know, <laughs> they know not only what they're against, but they come together around what they're for. And it is hard to get quote unquote progressives mm -hmm. to come together around what they're for, <laughs> right? We can, so we're always, it seems to me, we tend to be more reactive than proactive. And one of the things it seems to me that if we're going to quote unquote in, in this kind of theological religious language witness in terms of our faith and what we believe, then it's not only about responding to that which you are against and, and, and in protest. Protest is important. But it is also embodying and putting forth what you're for. And that's often a little harder because it, there's more risk and all of that involved. We don't do that well. Uh, uh, what we do well is we react, but it's time for us to begin to put forward a different kind of model of the way that we can be. Yeah. In terms, so, so that's one thing. And in terms, and I think that's in, there, it's instructive uh, as we listen to Richard Robinson, uh, so when really talking about trying to change narratives and uh, the power of, as I call it, discursive power. How do you begin to gain control, right, mm -hmm. of uh, the media and all of these other kind, these things that allow one to have that kind of presence on the public square to begin to change the collective consciousness uh, of a people. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're talking about. But only way to do that is for us to be a bit more vocal and uh, demonstrative in terms of what we're for and not to wait for another Martin. Mm. Because if we're, realities change from the bottom up. If, if, if subjugating power trickles down, change radiates up. Mm -hmm. And so that requires these movements from below. Uh, and not to wait for the sort of next miracle worker, which by the way, he just didn't come out of nowhere, mm -hmm. by the way. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so that's, I don't know. <laughs> 
Uh, I struggle with that question as well, but I think the beginning to the answer of that question is that we all have to do our part to make that change in the narrative. I'll say real quickly that I think there's some good news. One is that the analysis of how this happened, uh, we're getting some good analysis. I'll just recommend one that I just read. It's coming out next month. Uh, Ann Nelson, journalist um, who used to teach at Columbia's journalism school, uh, just has written a book on the Council for National Policy. This, 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 she, it's called Shadow Network. She describes this, this networking that was done, and there's a whole chapter in that book on the media and how people worked together over 40 years to get the media to portray their moral narrative, what we've described as a very distorted moral narrative, but their moral narrative to be normal in mainstream media reporting. If you talk to people just who watch the news every day about what Christians are doing in public, you associate it with what they've wanted. And, and they were very intentional about that. So you can read about that in Ann's book. It comes out next month. It's called Shadow Network. But I would say on the other side that you're absolutely right. There are lots of people who are lifting up another moral narrative. And the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival, is explicitly about uniting people who are doing this work in communities around the country to shift the moral narrative. That's actually the main goal of the campaign, to offer the country a different moral narrative in which systemic racism, systemic poverty, ecological devastation, the war economy, and this distorted moral narrative are seen as five interlocking injustices that are contrary to a moral agenda that we can all unite around. So I, I, would, I would refer you to the Poor People's Campaign as one place where people are coming together around leadership for a different moral narrative in public life. And can, yeah, thank you, and you're right. And can I say something else about that just in my thoughts? One of the things that we have to reckon with, I think, particularly in this moment in which we find ourselves in history. We often talk about how, in fact, 82% uh, of eva white evangelical Protestants voted for uh, this vision. Okay, take them out of the equation. They did. That was expected. But what we don't talk about is that, I think it's 56% of non-evangelical white Protestants voted for this vision. 59 to 60% of white Catholics voted for this vision. The majority of white Christian America voted for this vision. Yeah. So this other, this other narrative that's sitting in our churches, the majority of them voted for this vision and we don't talk about that. The, other thing when you say, so why isn't this uh, other narrative, these people that are doing this other work, why haven't they grabbed the attention of sort of the national media and the national zeitgeist and uh, the way in which the evangelical uh, fundamentalist Protestants have? Well, often because those people are from the very communities that are being dehumanized. Right? And so you got to get the quite, and, 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 and the black Christian community has been out there. It's, it's part of the history of the black faith tradition. Where are white Christians? Mm. And so we've got to get those majority of white Christians who supported that narrative or those who don't support that narrative have to raise a voice because the nature of white supremacy in this country, the nature of what we're talking about discounts those voices of color. You aren't good. They're, oh, that's what they're supposed to do. Yeah. Right? So we've got to get this other community, this other white community of Christians woken up, or is, is that a word, awake, yes. and to, to claim their voice yeah. on the public square. And then you might begin to see that change, but as long as it's folks like Barber and others who are doing it, well, that's what they do. Mm -hmm. And so you've got to get, get that, and we've got to change the way we understand who it was that supported and is sustaining this vision. Mm -hmm. No, it's important, yeah. Hi. 
Um, as we're talking uh, this afternoon, frankly, about um, alternative narratives that need to grab our society, um, I wanted to present one that we haven't mentioned yet. I'm here, and I know there are lots of others because we've been talking. There are a lot of us here who are very progressive Catholics, and we have a wonderful 2,000-year-old tradition called Catholic social teaching that is very similar, of course, to the things that, that Reverend Barber is talking about, whatever. It's not new. There's lots and lots and lots about it. And believe me, I'm not here to say everything about Catholicism is perfect or whatever, though I don't even go there. But there is a really, really rich tradition of teachings and writings and preachings from, from the Christian tradition that goes back to the beginning that people are starting to recognize, mm -hmm. partly because we have a pope who will let people talk about it now. Um, and I think all of these movements together, I took a little bit of, um, surprisingly, a little bit of solace from news that's come out the last few weeks, um, that maybe all of our work together is starting to work because I have seen several news stories and different social media and regular media at all about social justice is, is communism, social justice is this, it's, it's antithetical to being an American, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And there's a whole lot of defensiveness about people who were talking about social justice. And while it angers me to see that, maybe, maybe we're getting in a little more than They don't think fight we you are. when they're not concerned. They don't what? They don't fight you when they're not concerned. Right, 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 yeah. exactly. So, so, you know, always looking for little things to not be so despairing about these days. That's a little thing that if you start to look, you might start to see how often there are articles and news things and things on Facebook or whatever, people pushing so hard against those words, social justice, which are being used in a lot of circles these days, and they're, they're afraid of it. So anyway, and if anyone else is looking for things to research, go look at some of the Catholic social teaching. Thank you for bringing up Catholic social teaching. I think it is an important resource for all of us. And I would just add in terms of what we were talking about as white supremacy, that Anglo-Saxon narrative has always been uh, exclusive of Catholics, right? C Catholics were not real Americans, right? Which is why, you know, which is why, you know, an Al Smith type person, JFK, it was always suspect. And I think that's part of the, that's part of the intersection of the exclusive nature of this story. Um, and within all of our traditions, I think we need to ask what, what has been the cost of whiteness, right? What have Catholics had to give up to, come, to become white? You know, what did the Scotch-Irish people who settled the mountains of North Carolina that I came from give up to be white? Uh, because that's a huge part of how American identity has shaped people to leave a lot of these resources like the social teaching of the Catholic Church behind. And let's not fail to forget that this narrative is also a very uh, Christocentric narrative in an uh, exclusive way. And, and we can't be that, and we aren't that. Uh, uh, and that is, so it negates the religions of those who aren't a particular kind of Christianity, and it negates the uh, value and worth of people who aren't Christian. Yeah. And so it uh, is a narrative that discounts other faith traditions, uh, discounts uh, Jewish traditions, obviously Islamic traditions and others. And so this is uh, a xenophobic narrative, an intolerant uh, narrative. That's the way this narrative plays itself out, and that's why it's important to understand that we're talking about uh, sort of this evangelical Protestant Puritanism mm. that is at the root of what we're seeing today. Okay, we only probably have time for about two more questions. She has one, I think she has one, and we'll see where we're on time at that point. Okay, so I'm another one of the Catholics in the room. <laughs> from a progressive Catholic group, but you know, I'm from the Pacific Northwest and every time I go back for a family vacation, I'm driving my car around from town to town and I turn on the radio stations that are already on the car, the rental car, and they always have the right wing stations on them. 
and you know, it's the Christian right, and I'm always like very interested in what they're saying, and think, oh my gosh, we're in such silos because, you know, people who are on that political spectrum listen to those stations. And those of us who are not, we listen to WNYC here in New York and NPR and CNN, etc. And, you know, so I'm trying to think, how do we get through the silos? That's one thing. And speaking about, you know, the majority of the Catholics voting for our current president, um, it was on the basis of right to life that the Catholic bishops, you know, put out there as the one issue that should determine how you vote. They don't want to talk about social justice. Uh, they don't see right to life as the safety net. They don't see right to life as reforming the prison system. They don't see right to life as things that are you know, ref getting rid of things that are holding people of color down, communities of color. And it's so discouraging <laughs> that we hear that over and over in our, um, in our publications. And um, yeah, I just, that's, that's kind of part of, I think, how we got where we are right now. And I'm really concerned about what, um, you know, the person from Denmark said about the, the dark clouds over us and what do we do in this upcoming election cycle? If you could give us any wisdom about that. Can, can I? I'm just gonna say one word, vote. <laughs> Please. Please vote. But can I teach just a real, real quick uh, something that I know because of where I came from. This pro-life movement has a very specific origin in this country. And it has everything to do with the backlash against the civil rights movement. When the organizers of what was called the New Right uh, were trying to figure out how the, the power that white people had had before the civil rights movement could be maintained if all of these black people were voting. This was their problem, politically. They struggled with this in the 1970s. And they were trying to figure out how in a post-civil rights era they could unite white people without being explicitly racist. And a guy named Paul Weyrich went to Jerry Falwell when the IRS under the Carter administration cracked down on the segregation academies that Falwell and many others had started in the South. They started religious schools and they would sec you know, have segregated schools as religious schools to comply, quote unquote, with Brown in the public schools, but still have space for their white kids. That was the settlement you know, the, that, that they were working out in the 1970s. Weirich went to Falwell and told him, if you get on board with this pro-life, pro-family message, you can, you can unite those people without using racial language. And if you do that, we can lock down this block for at least 50 years. That's what he told him. And that's why the moral majority started. So I think it's incredibly important to inform people who care about life. Of course we care about life. As you were saying, you know, everything's about life. The environment, you know, climate change is about life. Health care is about life. Uh, and there, you know, are obviously conversations to have about policy around reproductive justice and all of these things. Okay, those conversations can be had, but this is about power. And this, this conversation of the pro-life coalition has a very specific origin. And I think if we can help to educate white voters about how people who wanted to hold on to white power with, without using racist language promoted racist policies by calling them pro-life, pro-family, I think we can at least reckon with what we're actually dealing with. And, you know, some people are gonna, are gonna say that's still where I am, but it lets at least compel people to choose which side they're on because I think it's a, it's a religious veneer to hide behind. No, I, thank you for that. Yeah. I, yeah, thank you for that. I think that's, that's exactly right. And it's the, it's the same thing, right, that you saw, saw with the drug laws. Yeah. How do we 
how do we do what we were doing without calling it race, right. racism? Yeah. And then they hid behind the drug laws. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you for that. Hi, my name's Rebecca Johnson. Um, I guess I count as a Buddhist convert and hopefully a future uh, adjunct uh, next semester here um, at Union. And I actually want to follow, my question has been about the drug laws and I was sitting trying not to think when I get some of my more interesting questions um, and it came to me that white supremacy and the opioid epidemic, white opioid epidemic, are two sides of the same coin. And I'm not sure like what that means in my mind. I've been struggling, I used to teach history of healthcare in the United States, and I have been struggling with how to understand um, the react, oh, I understand the reaction, but how to describe it um, given I come from a family of drug addicts, so you know black people and other people of color and poor people have been using drugs forever right but it seems to me the the concern about the decline in white long longevity and the turn in such uh, an obvious way to opioids coincides with the rise of white supremacy, uh, the new rise of white supremacy. So I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, I'm not quite sure on uh, what you're asking or what you're getting at. I'll, I'll just say yes, there are connections, but two, obviously in what we're seeing, one, uh, and uh, Rashad Robertson spoke to this a little bit. We've got it, you know, we're talking about powerful drug companies, capitalism, knowing what they're doing to make money uh, and putting these drugs into communities. We're talking about preying upon already uh, downtrodden uh, and dispossessed communities. Uh, and in this regard, even poor white communities. We're and so we know that it got much dispossessed people and uh, have more in common than uh, that crosses across these boundaries of race. We recognize it. So, but you have these powerful drug companies making money, just like uh, prison companies make money off of prisons, making money off of uh, drugs, and we see what it's done to people. But we also, and not a but, and we also know that depending upon whose bodies are being addicted to uh, the drug, that uh, in which communities are being uh, impacted by the drug depends upon how we respond to the addiction. So whether we're responding to it as a health crisis in a health emergency or whether we're responding to it as a uh, criminality, a crime. And so we're responding to this crisis as a health crisis, even to the point of, you know, producing things to help people who might go OD on it, right? And nobody was doing that in Harlem uh, or anywhere else. And so all of this, uh, and so people, that we're now responding with treatment as opposed to incarceration. Uh, but we're talking about the same things that bring people into being vulnerable to addiction. We're talking about the same powers that get people addicted, but we're t talking about different communities of people who are being addicted. And so, and, uh, and when we look at who those communities are, then we can pretty much predict what the response is going to be, if it's going to be incarceration or if it's going to be medication. Uh, yeah, and I, I think it just in terms of the very different response you see in public, it has everything to do with representation, and that has to do with that, you know, map that Donald Trump loves to show of these spaces that are imagined as red. But, you know, that's only slightly coded as white. 
uh, I think the, the demographic shifts that they are extremely afraid of is that those places are not nearly as white as they used to be. Go to them. We've been going to them all over the country with the Poor People's Campaign, and uh, uh, whether it's the Midwest or the Deep South, I mean, the, the, the voting population might still be majority white, but a lot of these places are not majority white anymore. And that means there's the potential for, I think, a new kind of coalition in those places, and, that, and, and health care has to be, public health has to be a part of that coalition, right? Black, white, and brown, poor people in you know, all sorts of places in this country have a lot of interest in coming together uh, around having representation that would respond to their actual needs in those communities. That's right, and so I think, I see the wrap up and exactly and in response even to that, what do we do? It is about representation. We need to be vigilant about what's happening with the census. And we also have to be vigilant with what's happening with the disenfranchisement of peoples, so that peoples in those areas in which you're talking about are not able to vote. Uh, and that's how they can control uh, the majority that is actually a minority. Uh, thank you, thank you. Thank you, bless you, <laughs> bless you. I love it. I'll just make one, uh, one quick announcement. Coffee has returned, for those of you who have asked. There's coffee and fruit outside if you want a quick snack. The next session will begin at 3 o'clock, promptly in here with Michelle Alexander, Jose Antonio Vargas, and Desmond Mead. So please, and you